and then you can either follow the greedy policy or you can do with epsilon probability do something random in the case of adp computing the greedy policy at that point would have involved converting the value into policy using t okay in q learning as long as you have q's you know your greedy policy right now what our state you are in the a with the highest q is the best action that's it it's in front of you so the exploration becomes even simpler that with probability 1 minus epsilon you do you pick the action with the highest q value in the state with probability epsilon you pick any of the other action any of the actions not just any of the other actions any of the actions randomly because the other random thing you would consider all actions and toss as a coin so this greedy action can also be picked up in the random side you see what i'm saying that's it this is q learning with exploration truly and in case you are wondering uh, the alpha go and in fact the first um, what are the, those uh, crazy the, so the atari games things use dqn remember the you may have some of you may have heard the dqn the q corresponds to q learning and the d corresponds to actually representing the q function as a deep neural network instead of q function as a table which is what we are doing here in fact going from tables to functions for the q values and values etc is the next big topic we will be doing that's essentially generalization okay so there are two kinds of learning one is learning about the future the other is generalizing what you know and both one is called inductive learning the other is called reinforcement learning okay uh, i am actually going to skip over these um, I want to, this is a few things that I want you to see and then I want to uh, do several some of these slides. Uh, keep this in mind. This is a beautiful cycle. So you have value and policy from which if you act, you get experience. You can go from experience using model free learning directly to value and policy. Or you can go from experience to model, which is the transition function. Then use Bellman updates. And this part is called planning in essence using Bellman updates you know model is transition function t using Bellman update to compute the value given the model is called the planning so you can either do planning and get there or you can go directly here planning is done in your head which is why I said having a model means you have the ability to plan your trip to Beijing without just doing the Nike thing and saying, I'll stand on the road and figure out. Whereas to swim from point A to point B, you don't plan. You just jump in and do it. Because you basically do model. OK? So that's a very beautiful picture to keep in mind. Um, so a bunch of things that I want to end uh, bring up quickly um, uh, before we end today, uh, one is that even though pure RL assumes that the agent has to act in the real world, in some sense that's what's happening in TD learning, for example, uh, and act, acting in the real world will happen, will work anytime. Even if you are on Mars, you can always act in the world. Okay? It's costly and you can die. I just hope, I, I hope that you're, I'm not making you so scared of acting that you'll just stay in the class and never move ever. You know, because I'm basically every time I'm saying, what the, acting in the world may, can make you die. But it also can get you Nobel Prizes. So, you know, you have to decide how to deal with the trade-offs. Okay, so it's the slowest and fastest way to learn, but it will always work. This is true reinforcement learning. The original reinforcement learning. RL with a simulator involves the agent using the simulator instead of the real world, like using the flight simulator, etc., or using the game simulator, etc. The advantage of simulator is you don't die. You say, oh, I would be dead then. It's still not mental simulation. It's like an external simulator. But that would be cheaper 
can avoid the non-ergodicity of the real world, where in the real world, if you die, you don't come back. In the simulator, you die, you can continue. Okay? And uh, can also be faster and cheaper than real RL. However, someone has to have built the simulator for you. Nobody has to build you the Earth. Earth is there. Mars is there. You want to do RL on Mars, you can just do RL on Mars. You go there and you know, start doing it. But if you want a Mars simulator, somebody has to build it first for you. The third thing, which became interesting only because of the web era, where everything winds up being uploaded into the web, is instead of you learning from your experiences, you can learn from other people's experiences. I kind of, you, we humans do this. Except we tend to take the old experiences, write books about them, and then we read those books. So the books sort of kind of tell you the important parts of the experience. If you don't have that, you can still say, I just can every possible set of transitions, sequence of transitions, some other agents have done in their lives. And then I will just basically use them to figure out if I did this, what would happen, if I did this, what would happen. And use their experience for doing my TD. Do you see what I'm saying? This actually has become possible only because of web, where everything is already being put on the online. So for example, AlphaGo had places of games played by millions of people that was available to it. And it could just use them. So it could live their lives just by kind of chugging through them. Normal humans will go crazy doing that. But for computers and stored you know, tracking, that's possible. The other thing that tells you why I'm wearing the basketball t-shirt today, uh, for professional games, especially like NBA basketball, because my son works as a data scientist there, so I know something about it. Um, as there is a significant amount of tracking data that's captured. So for example, in the NBA professional basketball, there's huge amounts of cameras that actually record everything that's going on on that little space. They have very high quality tracking data. And you can use this data to do activity recognition and then you can actually figure out what happened to other people doing various things and then run RL on this tracking data. This is a huge opportunity, I am told, for doing analytics for these games. In the past, this stuff was there, but people can't keep on watching the videos and making TD updates. The three-part TD updates I showed you, that was mind-numbing. And you have to do it billions of times when you have tons and tons of traces. Computers are great for that. So learning from other people's scanned experiences is useful. Let me just show at least this, that these slides exist. I know that you're about to run. Uh, you can actually think of RL in some areas, like in Dimitri Bertsakis, whose picture I showed you earlier. He doesn't call RL RL. He doesn't call it reinforcement learning. He calls it approximate dynamic programming. And this slide tells you the difference. The idea is there may be cases where you have the model, OK? You have the model, but T and R are available, but you don't want to use them. If you have T and R, you should just do MDP. Right? Policy equation, value equation, R online you know, inference. You may not want to say, you might say T and R are there. It's like the textbook is there for this class. The textbook is so big. Tell us some review material. Which is like you kind of sample the textbook and tell us some little things that we should study for the exam so that we we'll somehow win the exam. That is basically approximate preparation for exam or approximate dynamic programming. Where instead of using, even though you have the model, you don't want to use the model. Instead, you act as if the model will be a simulator of this world in which you will do RL. It's completely crazy. But that's the kind of thing you guys do, especially when I say there's an open book exam. People don't prepare for the exam at all. They just bring all their home books and say, oh, I'm sure during the exam I can very quickly figure out what's going on. 
If I ever say open book exam, I can you can be sure that the time taking to flip the pages, the cumulative time taking to flip the pages will be longer than the time of the exam. So you should actually have studied before. But this is kind of an approximate way of, even though you had the model, you didn't want to use it because it looks too costly. The night before, you wanted to go to a movie. So that's basically what's called approximate dynamic programming. And so this sort of completely removes the distinction between learning because you didn't have the model versus having the model and just doing inference. Here, I have the model, but I still don't want to do inference. I want to learn. Crazy stuff. But that's what control theory people think up and many people actually think up. The last thing I believe, actually this last thing I want to point out is reward sparsity and reward shaping. The thing that makes reinforcement learning very hard typically is for large numbers of transitions, there are no rewards. And in the end, you will say you win or lose. For example, in chess game, all the intermediate moves have no value. At the end, either you win or lose. Temporal difference learning will be very slow to converge in those kinds of scenarios. So normally when people say reinforcement learning doesn't work too well, they mean real world doesn't have enough rewards. It's too sparse a reward. That means it only comes only at the end. Now if you are designing a world where you know reinforcement learning agents are going to be working, such as yourself, you want to kind of make rewards so that they will have their enthusiasm up until the end of the semester. So you can reward shape by saying there are homework points, there are you know, midterm points, there is other points, there are other points. But finally, the only thing that matters maybe for the course is the course grade. And the true reward is at the end of the course, you'll figure out what your grade is. In fact, the true reward is not even that. In fact, the, most of these rewards that I make up might make the agent go in some directions, but they could be completely spurious rewards. They may not have any correlation to the true value. So for example, I would take homeworks, midterms, bachelor's degrees, MS degrees, these are all, these are all pseudo rewards. The only reward is getting Nobel Prize maybe. <laughs> so the last thing I want to mention is that this joke that uh, a Jedi, uh, there's a bunch of scholars who are discussing when does Bach start? When does, in, does it start at the moment of conception or when the baby comes out? Because after all, this is the big thing for pro-choice versus pro-life. And the Judaic scholar says, you know, in Judaism we don't have this problem because we don't consider a poet as to be a human being until it gets its PhD. <laughs> <laughs> we will end there. <laughs> <laughs>